All right, so we're going to get started today. Um, first off, though, I want to talk about the handouts that you have sitting in front of you. Um, we have our standard exercise, uh, this, today's exercise 104. That's what we're going to do in lab today, um, which is just like normal. But you also got a handout for your first assignment, which is assignment 101. This assignment is due on Wednesday the 19th. So we have like a week and a half. It's not next Wednesday, it's the Wednesday after, so I guess it's two, two weeks from today. Um, and so we're, what we're doing is essentially we're building on the skills that you're learning today and, tomorrow, and Monday in class to create a photograph that's a really good photograph. And uh, I think one of the things that people tend to be confused about initially when, uh, when we start switching from the exercise to the assignment and, and what have you is that the assignment is more than just I followed the steps and I did the, the, the stuff that I did in the exercise and I'm calling it good. Because this is, it's really about deciding which pieces of all the things that I'm going to teach you, of all the skills that I'm going to teach you, are appropriate and make your image look really good. Because it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do everything. So I'm not looking for you to take an image and do every single thing that we, we talk about in class to it. I'm looking at you as a designer deciding what's important and what should I do and what shouldn't I do and what makes this a really good quality image. And so it's things like composition, but it's also do I perform a levels adjustment? Do I do a curves adjustment? Uh, you know, maybe I'm going to do some blending modes to it. Um, there's a bunch of strategies that we'll talk about, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's applicable to everything. And you'll see that today when we do our, um, our samples today in the lab exercise. Some of, sometimes we'll do a levels adjustment and it really won't change anything. And other times it'll be a dramatic difference in the photo. So it depends on the photo. So you're going to be uh, adjusting for what it is that's appropriate to you. So a couple keynotes about the assignment. First off, the image that you're going to pick has to be taken um, from the January 27th, which is the first day of class forward. So anything from the first day of class going forward you can use. Anything that you did over winter break, you went on some awesome trip to Machu Picchu or Costa Rica or whatever, those are illegal. Right? It needs to be a fair playing field. Everybody has to take a current image uh, for it. So that's one of the, the, the things. Obviously, you have to take the image. I mean, I shouldn't even have to say this. This should be obvious. You can't find an image online and use the image that's online. Believe it or not, there's a reverse image search where I can drop your image into a reverse image search and it'll tell me where it is on the web. So I can check that, I can verify that, etc. Generally speaking, I've never had an issue with it. There's, in 12 years, there's been a couple cases where people have decided that somebody else's work is better than their own and they've tried to pass it off. I've caught it every time. So don't do it. It's not worth it. Take your own picture. You'll do well anyway. Right? This is a pretty easy, this is like I'm lobbing you an assignment to get started. So it's not that bad. Uh, okay, so you're going to go through and do your cropping and, and, and uh, all of your, your uh, post-processing to it. Then you're going to take that final image and you're going to do two things with it. The first thing that you're going to do is you're going to post it online on the course website. And you're going to check the box for assignment 101. You're going to post it with the original image. So it's the, the, the corrected one and the original one so I can see the change. And then you're going to write a little paragraph that says, this is what I did. I did a levels adjustment. I did. It doesn't have to be verbose. It could be bullet points. That's OK. But I want to know what changes you made to it. I cropped it. I did a levels adjustment. I did a curves adjustment. And I changed the blending mode here, or whatever it was. So you go through that. You write a little paragraph, and you submit it. That is the version that I will grade. So I'm going to look at it online. I'll look at it on the course website. I'll grade that version. I also ask that you take just the final version, the, the good one, and you send it over to the M750 color laser printer in class. It costs like 25 cents. So it's across the way in 116. And you give me just an 8.5 by 11 print of it. Nothing fancy. No, you don't have to go to like a, a, you know, a photo development place. You, know, you don't have to go to Costco and have it digitally printed. No, I just need a paper copy. And you'll see that I do this on most of the assignments. I ask for a paper copy just so that I have a reference. If everything were to fail, all my backups were to fail and whatever, uh, and the website went down, I still have a paper copy of what you turned in. So just in case, I have that paper copy. Um, so I ask you to do that as well. I'm not concerned with the timing of the paper copy as much as I'm concerned with the timing of posting your actual work. Remember, if I start talking, that's the, that's the cutoff on uh, Wednesday the 19th. The other thing to keep in mind is um, Monday, the, what is it? It would be 17th is a holiday. It's President's Weekend. 
so you guys don't have, we don't have class on that Monday. I'll remind you when it gets closer. So uh, next week you'll have Monday and Wednesday. So we do today, Monday, Wednesday. Those are the three days in class. And then you don't have Monday and it's due that Wednesday when you come back. So I don't like scheduling things after uh, holidays, but sometimes it just works that way. Uh, when, when we get to spring break, I, I think in this class I've adjusted the schedule so that your assignments do right before spring break, before you leave, and then you don't have to worry about it. There's nothing worse than having something hanging over you when you're on break. So I try not to do it, but in this case, I'm sorry. But it's not like it's due the day you come back. You come back on Tuesday, and then it's due on Wednesday. So there's still a day in there. Okay, so that's your uh, assignment 101 that you're going to start working on. Remember, assignments, you, you might have a little bit of time if you finish early in class to start working on it, um, but it's for you to do on your own time. There's not necessarily a lot of time in class uh, or scripted time in class to work on it. I'm not going to say, okay, everybody, we're going to work on assignment 101. That's not how it's going to work. So I say, I think at the end of the exercise today, I say, if you have time, there you go. It's at the bottom under part three. If you have time, you can start working on your uh, assignment. So I mention it if you have time, but it's not like a scripted thing. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the, the basics of post-processing. So give me just a second here to unlock my iPad. All right, so we're going to start talking about uh, post-processing and developing a digital workflow and what kinds of things are we going to do during the post-processing when I talk about that. So the first thing is the term workflow. The term workflow refers to a set of steps that you typically do when it comes to shooting a photo. And the truth is that you do this even if you like are posting something to Snapchat or whatever. Um, essentially, you're, you're setting up a set that starts with capturing the original image. Obviously, you have to capture the image to start anyway. And then you're going to perform some edits to it, and then you're going to do something with the photo. And so this thing, if we, if we really stop and think through it, it starts to make intuitive sense. Of course, there would be a workflow. All I'm trying to do today is expand the possibilities of the middle part of that workflow. So what can we do in something like Photoshop that really enhances the image versus just slapping a filter on or, or whatever? Uh, that you guys would typically do in Instagram or, or what have you. So um, that middle step is what's going to expand today. Um, and so we, we take the image, then we get it into the computer. Ideally, we use some kind of a photo management application, and I'll talk about what some of those are to keep track of the photos and to organize the photos a little bit. Uh, and then we do some kind of post-processing to it. Ultimately, we're going to export it, and we're going to post it somewhere, or maybe not. Maybe it'll go into some album someday. I mean, it depends. but. Generally, we have these hundreds and thousands of photos that are just sitting around that we don't do anything with. But they sit there. Uh, and so that's the outputting of the photos. So my guess is you already have this workflow, at least to some extent. We're going to modify it today a little bit. What software do we plan to use? Well, in class today, we're going to be using Photoshop. We don't have a good photo management app that's available on the, the lab computers. It's something that's kind of a personal thing on your home computer that you would be using. I'll talk about what they are. You can choose to use them. You can choose to adopt them if you want. Um, we're going to talk about what kind of post-processing you typically need to do. You'll learn um, pretty quickly that there are certain things that you tend to have to do as a photographer to make your images better. Like I know for me, generally I have to do a levels adjustment on almost all my photos. So that's just something that I keep in mind. Okay, here's my photo. I want to make a quick enhancement to it. First thing I do is I go to levels because that's typically what I need to do. It may be totally different for you. You might never need to do a levels. It just depends on how you work as a photographer. So we're going to go through that. Sometimes there's some automated techniques where you can have Photoshop just do it for you or Lightroom just do it for you, uh, where you can apply. It's kind of like applying a filter, but it's something that's a little bit more advanced. Uh, and then how would your photos be used? Where are they going to be used long term, et cetera? So when we talk about software, first question is, is it, are you on Windows or are you on a Mac? Because that makes a big difference in how you, how you manage your photo library. Are you on your personal computer, your laptop, or are you on the lab computer? Or do you want to just work online? Do you want to work on your iPad, et cetera? That's going to change. The next thing is non-destructive editing. So depending on which software we use, some of the editors are what's called destructive, which means you make changes and you can't selectively go back and turn those changes off. So I make an edit, then I make another edit, then I make another edit, and I say, wait a minute, you know, I didn't like the first edit. 
can you go back and uncheck the first edit and say, don't apply that anymore, but keep the other things that I do? Or do you have to undo all the way through? That's what I mean by destructive and non-destructive. A non-destructive editor, I convert it to black and white, then I do a levels adjustment, then I do a curves adjustment, then I do a blending mode. Oh, you know what? I didn't want it black and white. I uncheck that box. Hey, no problem. That's a non-destructive editor. A destructive editor says, wait a minute, you're all the way down here. You've got to undo all the rest of those steps to get back to that black and white to undo the black and white. Or, no, I'm sorry, you can't even do that anymore. So that's a destructive editor. So depending on what uh, program you're using, you may or may not have that ability. The other thing is, are you a professional photographer or are you in the amateur free stage? Um, free stage is usually zero to 10,000 images if you're organizing your photo library. Pro stage is usually 10,000 or more images. Um, that's a little bit loose. You could just take a lot of photos. You could be an amateur but take a lot of photos, in which case you might benefit from a more professional option even though you're not really a professional. So let's look at some of the free options that are out there. Um, this is Google Photos which is available if you have a Gmail account. If you go to photos.google.com, they have a lot of presets that are available for you um, that you can basically, it's, it's almost like Instagram, where you say, I want this filter applied. Um, they're, not, they're not designed to be corny filters like an Instagram would be, where you might you know, have it look kind of goofy, dealing with the heat in here, deciding whether I want to have my jacket on or not. Um, so that, that's going to be, you know, kind of a, you, you look at the preview, you pick it, and you say, yeah, that's what I want my image to look like. So it's kind of a preset. So there's not a lot of fine-tuning ability that's, that, that's available there, but you do have a little bit of advanced editing capabilities. Uh, you obviously have to have a connection to the Internet, hence you have to go to the um, web browser. And it's kind of a semi-destructive editor. And what I mean by a semi-destructive editor here is that you can, while you're working on the photo, you can go back and forth, you can undo a couple steps and whatever, but when you're done and you save the photo, you can no longer go back and change the edits anymore. So it becomes permanent once you save the photo. So while you're working on it, it's, it's non-destructive, but then it becomes destructive when you bake it in and, and get the output uh, at the other side. Photoshop Express, different than actual Photoshop. It's one of the Adobe products that they uh, offer to you. It's available on iPads and, and mobile devices, Androids, etc. cetera. Um, and it's kind of the same thing, where you can could, you could see in this example here, we have the original image, and then they have a bunch of filters that we can kind of apply to it that hopefully enhance the image. So it's designed to be fairly easy. You pick the filter and call it a day. It's very similar to um, the, the Google Photos. With the presets, it's pretty easy to, to email or download your pictures. It has a few semi-advanced editing features, not too many. You have to have a connection to the internet. It is a destructive editor, so once you make your changes, you've made your changes, and they're baked in. Uh, and it requires some kind of a mobile device to work with. It's not going to be available on a desktop. Uh, Pixlr is another website that you can go to that's kind of increasing what the capabilities are of these kinds of software, so you get a little bit more um, fine-tuning availability, a little bit more uh, tools that are available. They also have this Pixlr editor version. So they have their basic version. Again, both of these are free. And then they have the editor version, which looks almost exactly the same as Photoshop. So it's really kind of shockingly close to Photoshop. There's a few things that it doesn't offer, like it doesn't offer adjustment layers, and there's, there's a few things that are different, but you can get a lot of the way there, and it's free which is pretty cool if you don't want to actually subscribe to the Creative Cloud. Um, you, you save it back to your flash drive, <clears throat> kind of like an application. You're working on the file, you save it back, etc. It requires an internet connection. Um, there's pretty advanced editing features that are available in there. Like I said, it's shockingly Photoshop-like. Um, it does require flash. Um, so you have to have Flash installed on your computer, which is kind of iffy these days. It used to be just automatic. Everybody would have Flash on their computers. Not so much anymore. Uh, photos, which is on the Mac, um, if you're in the Mac ecosystem, if Photos is not as good as it, well, it could be better, let's put it that way. Um, uh, they used to, Mac used to offer two choices. They had a uh, basic option that was called iPhoto, and then they had a professional option that was called Aperture. Aperture was awesome, and I used it, and I loved it, and I had my whole library in it, and then Apple discontinued it, and they just, like, cut it off. And they said, no, we're not doing it anymore. And it's so sad because it was awesome. 
It was really good. Had almost all the features that Photoshop had in it. It was all baked in. It was just great. And I loved it, managed everything. It had backups. It was awesome. Anyway, they got rid of it. So now we're stuck in this Photos version. Um, but it does, if you're, if you're very Apple-centric and you have an iPhone and you have an iPad and you have a Mac, it plays really nice with all of them. It's designed to do that, so that's good. It does have a fair number of advanced editing features, including some of the histograms, curves, uh, levels adjustments. So a lot of the stuff that we're gonna do in Photoshop is available right in the program, which is nice. Um, and it does have a bunch of metadata support. It's great at organizing pictures and how you create your albums and facial recognition, et cetera. So for that purpose, it's really a good organization tool. Um, and so if you're in the Mac ecosystem, I would encourage you to use that uh, because it's built in. But again, if you have any of your devices are not part of that ecosystem, you're kind of left out in the cold because it doesn't uh, really work if you're not in that. We get into the professional options. Um, there's not too many super professional options. Like I said, Aperture uh, from Apple used to be one of these, but that got cut out. Um, there's an independent one that's out there that's called Luminar. And I'm not big on proposing, hey, you should go buy this, you should go buy that, etc. This is one that I actually bought, um, even though I use Photoshop a lot, because it works a little bit easier than Photoshop in a lot of things. Uh, they tout a bunch of uh, AI features that are in it that help adjust your image to get really good results. And the truth is, I think it does a really good job with a couple clicks. Um, it's about 70 bucks, I think. Uh, they might have a student version, I don't, I don't exactly remember. It has a lot of the advanced features, but it has this great before and after, so you can slide this little um, line across your image and see what the image looked like before and after, so you can kind of check what it's looking like. Uh, and it's got a lot of really nice stuff that's built into it, uh, but again, it costs money, so it's a little bit more. It does a little bit of, um, if you work in the standalone app, it does a little bit of the organization, but it's not as extensive as, say, something like photo or Photos or Lightroom, uh, which I'll talk about next. Uh, but it also has a plug-in for those other programs. So if you work extensively in Photoshop, you can have this uh, Luminar as a plug-in to Photoshop, where you can open it quick in, in Luminar, make some edits, and then go back into Photoshop. So it's kind of nice in that context as well. Uh, but it's something that you could certainly look at if you were interested in, in exploring it. Uh, Adobe has a product that is meant to work in conjunction with Photoshop. It's part of their Creative Cloud suite, uh, and it's called Adobe Lightroom. And what Adobe Lightroom is, is it's the organization side of photo editing. So it's about how do you organize all your photos. You have this massive library. How do you organize them? And then how do you perform the most basic edits? So it's going to go through, well, I shouldn't say the most basic. It's going to do a lot of things uh, that Photoshop would do but it's gonna do the levels adjustments and the curves and that sort of thing. And if you really need the power of Photoshop, you need to use Clone Stamp or something like that, which again, all these things we'll talk about in the demo portion. If you need to do that, you can quickly go from Lightroom into Photoshop and then back into Light, uh, Lightroom. So it's, a, it's meant to work with the Adobe suite, the rest of the Adobe suite. So it's nice. And if you're part of the whole Creative Cloud subscription, you get access to this, depending on what tier you're in. And so it might be worth exploring. Um, but it's definitely a full-fledged professional option that's out there. Uh, so it's expensive because you've got to pay that monthly fee on it. You have a lot of the advanced editing features built right in. You can easily throw it into Photoshop and come right back into it. It keeps all of your um, photos organized with metadata, et cetera. And then the last one, which is what we're going to do in class today, is, of course, Photoshop. Uh, and so Photoshop is kind of the, the gold standard of photo editing. It's the most advanced of all of them. You have the most features that are available to you. You can do pixel by pixel corrections. Um, heck, you could be an artist and just paint in Photoshop because it's that powerful. So it's a really great uh, piece of software, but it doesn't do any of the photo organization side. It's just about editing the photo. So essentially, you take your photo, you open it in Photoshop, you perform your edits. That's, that's it. It's not going to keep track of metadata or, or anything else about the photos. It's just about making the photo look good. Organizing your images. So the thing about a digital file is that there's more than just the photograph that's stored with the file itself. And I, you guys might have had like an ant that, that took photos, uh, that took like film photos back in the day, maybe, where there was like a little date and time that was printed in the bottom in orange. Do you guys remember this vaguely? It was like a big feature in the camera where you had like what the date and time was of the photo. Essentially, digital files contain that information. We just don't see it. It's just in the background. It's stored with the file. And it stores a lot more than just that. 
So this data is about the photo. And so here's an example. I pulled it up here. Um, this was shot a long time ago. We can look at the date. It was shot in 2008, so it's an old, old photo. But we can look right here um, on the screen, and you can see, first off, what camera it was shot with, but also what lens was on the camera when I shot it. We can see that it was shot in RAW. And here's all that stuff that I was talking about last class. There's the ISO. There's the, the lens, my exposure value. Can't win today. My pen's died. There's the exposure value. That's my aperture. There's my shutter speed. So it's giving me all that information about the photo. But it's also giving me stuff like the date and time that I took it, what, what the size is, etc. If you're working in your phone, if you're taking pictures with your phone, it's also stamping in where you took it from a GPS location. You know when you first open up your phone, it's a brand new phone, and it says, the camera would like to use your location, and say yes. Because everybody just says yes to that stuff. Sure, yes, 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 whatever. You're essentially giving it permission to bake into these photos that you take exactly where you took it from a GPS location, which is really a nice, neat way of organizing your photos. You can see all the photos that were shot in one particular area uh, relatively easily. When we get into organizing, we're talking about albums, places, et cetera. I'll talk about what all these are in a little bit um, more. But this is essentially how do you keep your photos in some form of organization. Um, and this is, this is getting really easy, uh, especially because it's syncing between your devices and, and kind of keeping track of it for you. But essentially, albums are folders that you say, hey, all of these photos, I went to Disneyland, all of these photos are going to go in my Disneyland album. Right, it's kind of like the old school, I have a book of printed photos and I can flip through it. Same thing. It's just the digital equivalent to that. Uh, I would point out that you can always do a smart album where you say, hey, take all the photos that I rated five stars and put them in an album. Or take all the photos that are you know, a specific, taken with a specific camera or taken in a specific GPS location and put them in an album. So they're relatively smart in terms of how you can organize it. Uh, next thing is events, and I thought this, back in the day when this came out, this was probably 10 years ago now, this was kind of a novel concept. And the concept here is that computers are smart enough to know that typically you don't take one photo every minute of every day. You take 10 photos together, and they generally belong together, because you were at a birthday party and you took those photos. Then you don't take photos for a while, and then you go out to dinner that night and you take some more photos. Well, typically those photos belong together. So computers are smart enough to realize that these groups of photos tend to happen around events. And so they will automatically group your photos into those kinds of events, which is kind of nice. You can also specify that these events shouldn't last too long. Uh, other thing that, that all this software can do now um, is essentially once you tell it who you are, or once you tell it who somebody is in the photo, it can perform facial recognition on, on the photos and, and collect photos of you, or collect photos of your wife, or collect photos of your girlfriend, or whatever. Hopefully you don't have a wife and a girlfriend, but you get what I'm going. Um, and it can collect all those photos and put them in one place, which is kind of nice. So it's just another way of organizing it. It's certainly something that's very, very common in this day and age. Um, places is essentially those GPS tags that I was talking about earlier. So show me all the pictures that I took in Rome, Italy. Well, that's cool. I can see all those pictures. It doesn't matter when I took it. They're just all taken right there. Show me all the pictures that I took at the beach or whatever, and you can see that grouping of images, which is kind of a nice way of organizing your files. Typical adjustments. So I, know I used to spend a lot more time on organization, but really the organization falls on you um, because it's not something we're going to be able to do in this class too much. But when we talk about what are the typical adjustments that you make to an image after the fact. So you went out and you shot a bunch of images. That was your assignment one or your exercise 103. Um, and now that you're back in on your computer, what are the typical adjustments that you're going to go through? Well, the first one, the most common one, is to do some cropping and resizing. So you took this particular image right there, and you say, you know what? I'm going to crop that image to better show these two people. So I'm going to make those adjustments. Adjust for the composition, the rules of composition that I talked about last class. You make those adjustments here. The other key note to, to point out about cropping and resizing images is that you always want to make them smaller. You never want to be trying to make images bigger. If you make images bigger, they're just going to get blurry. No matter how good the software program is, it can't add resolution. So you shoot at the maximum resolution, and then you crop down. So here we are in Photoshop doing a crop. Notice that the crop tool in Photoshop automatically has the rule of thirds showing up. We already see that, that grid uh, right here. 
So we're seeing that grid. It shows up. It helps us align the images and make sure we're placing the people on that rule of thirds. So there's another example with the rule of thirds. I had to throw this one in here because I love this picture. It's not mine, but I would love to work there. That sounds fantastic. I don't know how you get internet or power or any of the rest of it, but I like the concept. Exposure. So this is when you inadvertently expose the image incorrectly. I'm taking the picture of you guys. I want to see all your faces, but I accidentally expose for outside, and all of you are too dark. So I need to make that correction. Or I accidentally take the picture that's too dark, and I want to make it lighter. If it's too dark um, and you want to make it lighter, generally that's acceptable. If it's too light and you want to make it darker, right. If it's too light and you want to make it darker, so I want to make sure my, my words were correct, um, that can be iffy unless you shot in raw. So it's always easy to go from dark to light. Going light to dark can be difficult depending on um, how you shot the image. So there's an example uh, of making that correction. Brightness and contrast, these are, these are really crude tools. And so it's something that people tend to jump to, and they say, oh, I'm just going to adjust the brightness. I'm going to make this image brighter. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the contrast a little bit stronger. But it tends to be like, uh, instead, of, instead of painting with like a fine watercolor brush, you, know, you get out your 8-inch giant brush, and you dip it in the paint, and you slap it on. Like it's not, it's not designed to be uh, a fine adjustment. And so we kind of stay away from that if we can avoid it. But it can make a difference. Color, saturation, or vibrance. This is essentially when we have, you know, like I showed you that white balance problem last class where the image was blue and it needed to be shifted more into the orange because the whites were blue. We can make those kinds of color corrections. And we can also add to the color. We can make the, the image more saturated or have more color in it. Or better yet, have more vibrance in it. And there's a difference between saturation and vibrance. So here's an example of the difference between saturation and vib vibrance. If we adjust the saturation on an image, we're adding color to the whole image. We're boosting the color values of the whole image. The problem with adding to the saturation is that if you have any people in the photos, they turn into Oompa Loompas. Right? Some of you might have never seen that movie. You have no idea what I'm talking about because it was ancient. But uh, the point is that people become really orange. And that's generally not the right strategy. So uh, we developed saturation for all the colors. Vibrance is all the colors except skin tones, except the oranges. So we're not boosting those. We're boosting everything else. So we're boosting the, the blues and the greens and the reds, but not the skin tones. And so it selectively keeps those out. So if you want to boost. Uh, the color values in an image that has people in it, you're going to stick to the vibrance side of things rather than the saturation side of things. We can also take a color image and we can convert it into black and white or a sepia tone. A sepia tone is essentially just a black and white image, but it's kind of brown and white instead. Um, it's, it's an old-fashioned looking image, but you can take that current new image and you can convert it into uh, a black and white image. The nice thing about shooting in color and then converting to black and white is that there's a lot of ability to tweak how it's converted to black and white. And I'm going to show you that live today during the Photoshop time where I talk about how do you convert an image to black and white. And you'll see what kind of flexibility you have there. Focus. So we can actually sharpen an image a bit to make little edges stand out or give us a little bit more definition, uh, we could also slightly blur parts of the image or the whole image to give a soft focus to it if we wanted to. The thing here is that if the image is blurry to begin with, we're not going to be able to go back and unblurry it, for lack of a better term. So if you caught a picture of somebody moving and their face is blurry, you're not going to be able to suddenly go back and say, oh, no, I didn't want that to be blurry. So this is not that kind of correction. It's a very small scale correction. So here's an example right here. And if you look really closely, it's hard because this is like doubled down on a projector and you can't see it as well. Uh, this one here is the original. But right next to it, if you look right at the edges of these pages, you can see that they have just a little bit more definition. They're not quite as blurry. They're just a little sharper. Uh, and so we can do those kinds of things where that micro contrast causes those edges to stand out. It's a little contrast between the blacks and the whites. So that's something that we can do on an image. And sometimes you have to do it on, on your actual computer and, and see it happen. We can do red eye reduction or red eye illumination. You guys have seen this happen. The reason that red eye happens, anybody know why red eye happens? 
Exactly, exactly. And the reason that it reflects is because typically on all our cameras, these being a classic example, the lens of the camera is right next to where the flash is. So the idea is that when it's dark, your eyes, your pupils are really expanded. Somebody goes to take a picture and that flash happens, the light goes in and bounces off the back of your eye and comes back out and we get that little red reflection. Some cameras do the flash ahead of time. The idea behind the flash ahead of time and then you get the real flash is that you're trying to shrink your, your iris down so that you don't get as much reflected light. The truth is the best way to avoid it is to be like a wedding photographer where you have the, the flash further away from the camera. You have the big flash or you reflect the flash off the ceiling or, or whatever. Um, and so you can do that and that avoids it. That's why wedding photographers don't have red eye problems. No surprise, because they just bounce it off the ceiling or they keep it far away from the lens so you don't get that in and out. We can, of course, fix it in Photoshop. That's pretty easy. Um, so you can, you can change that afterward. Levels adjustment. So levels adjustment is probably going to be the most common adjustment for all of you, something that you all need to learn how to do and to, be, to, to get really comfortable with. Uh, it's something that we can do in Photoshop and it's something that you can do in a lot of the more advanced photo editing tools. So like Photos for Mac or Lightroom, you can do the same kind of thing. And essentially what we're doing, and I'm going to show you the example photos and I'll point it out there uh, as well. And then we'll do it live because no matter how much I talk about this in lecture, it doesn't always sink in exactly what, uh, what we're doing. But what we're doing with a levels adjustment is we're saying, okay, in a given image, there's a spectrum of colors that if we looked at the gray value of that color, the equivalent gray value, it would go from pure white all the way to pure black. And typically when we take a photo, pure white isn't really pure white and pure black isn't really pure black. So we end up with a picture that looks like this. So the one on the left is the original image. And so if I look at this image and I say, okay, well, when I look at this image, what's pure white in this image? Well, maybe it's this edge right there. Maybe it's that little piece right there. I don't know, maybe it's that little piece right there. But is that really pure white? No, it's kind of like maybe light gray, best case. If I look at this image and I say, okay, well, what's pure black? All right, well, maybe over here in the shadow, that could be pure black, you know, right in there, something like that. That could be pure black. But really, it's dark gray. It's not really black. So when we do a levels adjustment, we transform the image here and we say, okay, this, which is white, is pure white now. It's not gray anymore, it's actually white. And this over here is not dark gray, it's actually black. And so we're spreading this histogram. So if we go back a slide right here and we look at this little graph, this graph right there represents the distribution of pixels. So if we were to count the number of pixels in an image, which is like 2 million pixels or 5 million pixels or 10 million pixels. If we counted all those individuals and we got the relative gray value of them from white to black and we plotted them on a little graph, the middle range is kind of the middle grays. So we have lots of that value and it tapers off when we get to this side and it tapers off when we get to this side. So in this particular image that represents the image that I showed you a second ago, the, the, the whitest pixel only came to there on the color spectrum. So we take what pure white is over here and we pull it over to be where our image should be white, so where the graph starts to go up. Likewise, we say, okay, well, there's not really any black until right about here, so we pure, pull pure black over to that point. It will make a lot more sense when I do it live in front of you and we all do it together. So just bear with me and trust me that it'll make more sense later. But I like to try to point it out ahead of time. Okay. So curves. Curves is something that is definitely more advanced. It will take you a while and it's really, really hard. If you thought the last one was hard for me to explain verbally, curves is almost impossible to explain verbally. Uh, the, essentially, curves allows you to selectively adjust certain parts of the image. So you can take the lighter parts of the image and make the lighter parts of the image lighter or darker without affecting the darker part of the image. So we can selectively control certain pieces of the image and make those adjustments. Very difficult to kind of explain what's going on other than to tell you that and then do it together. Uh, and so we will definitely do that together as we go forward. But you can see doing these curves adjustments can make big changes to the images themselves. So we'll talk through that and I'll give you a live demonstration of that. Then we get into the final results, printing, web export, 
she's posting them on Instagram, whatever. The idea here is that we're post-processing in Photoshop, we're getting the best quality image, and then that best quality image is what goes out. Uh, and so we're going to concentrate on that parts of it. And they could be going to web galleries or, or whatever. The truth is that I don't really care where you put it anymore. This part is beyond my realm. I just want to teach you how to make good quality image, images and, and how to process them in a way that gives you really, really good results. Okay, so this talk part was shorter today because I'm going to spend time now, after we did the lecture, jumping over into actually doing some post-processing. So this semester, we have the ability to use the remote desktop version of our computer labs. And so this is something that's been set up, and I've already instructed this in the 136 class, but I thought I would instruct it kind of as a universal uh, set of directions for how do you log in for 135 or 136 or heck, 121. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to uh, follow along with this Digital Life 1.20 remote desktop at DVC. I have that written out on the course website here uh, to log in, but I'll also show you how to access it. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go to a website that is https colon slash slash idm.dvc.edu. And I'm going to use this as the standard DVC login. I'll go ahead and use my insight. I'm using a password manager there to keep my passwords complicated. And once we log in, a couple things that we want to set up. There's some few few basic options that we want to go to. So before we actually launch our uh, virtual machine here, go to your personal settings. This would be over on the right side under your initials. And when you click on those, you can go to the, the little settings menu here. And these are our personal settings. We want to change how you would like to launch the Horizon Remote apps right here to the Horizon client. That should be clicked. So if it was on browser, we want to switch over to the client. And if you haven't installed the Horizon client yet, go ahead and click on that install link. And when you do that, it will actually open uh, the VMware page and take you to where you can download this for either for Windows or for Mac, et cetera, depending on what you're, what you're working on here. So once you have that set as the Horizon client, go ahead and click on the update button. There we go. And so mine's been updated. Now when I go back to my apps, under virtual here, we're going to see what, what computers I have access to. I'm going to use this ET124-H, and I'll go ahead and click on the open button. Now, when I click on that open button, it's going to actually uh, first prompt me, Do I, am I sure I want to open it in the client? Yes, I do. I'll, I'll have to accept the technology acceptable use policy. And then it will go ahead and start launching the DVC page. Now I have mine up on an external monitor, so I'm going to need to bring it down so that you guys can see it here. Uh, there it is. And I can go ahead and say OK. And it's going to go ahead and start logging in to the DVC uh, Engineering Technology Lab. First thing uh, that I've done, just like I asked you guys to do, um, was I went ahead and I logged into Photoshop. I opened up Photoshop. Uh, and now with Photoshop open, I can go ahead and open some sample images. Uh, for you guys in your exercise 104, I'm asking you to pick what you would consider to be your three best images, and then we'll work with those three images and perform all these edits on each of those three. For my purposes, uh, doing the demo part, I'm going to jump around between five or six images because I want to show you w where these apply and where the dramatic changes happen. Um, because not every one of these techniques is applicable to every image. And when you guys do your three example images, you'll find that, oh, well, I didn't really get anything out of the curves adjustment on this image, or I didn't get anything out of the levels adjustment on that image. Um, so in my case, I'm going to jump around to make sure that you can see the difference as it's happening. Um, so first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to open up uh, one of the images. So I'll go to the File menu, and I'll choose Open. And from there, I'm going to go onto my flash drive. I already have these stored uh, for me to open up. You guys will be looking uh, for your images. There we go. I'm going to start with this one. And like I said, I'm going to jump back and forth between a bunch of these. Yeah. Uh, do you think it's recommended to adjust the resolution on a picture? Like, uh, for example, if I have one that is 180 pixels, should I leave it like that? Or That's. You, yeah, you don't want to go up. You never want to go up. You only want to go down. So if you have an image and you need to adjust size, you can go down but not up because it'll just 
add more of the blurry pixels. So you won't really gain anything. If you crop the width and the height, also would not help. Right? It's going to make it go down in size. Yeah. But we can, we can talk through it more. OK, so I've gone ahead and I've opened up my first image. I want to walk you through uh, the Photoshop workspace just so that you have a better idea of what's going on. Now, I know most of you are already familiar with Photoshop. You've already done stuff in Photoshop because it's kind of the easiest one to get your feet into of the Adobe suite. Uh, but I still want to walk through what's going on and, and stuff. So in Photoshop, we have uh, the typical menu structure at the top. Uh, we'll be working extensively with layers. Even today, we'll be working with layers. So we'll go to the layer menu quite frequently. Uh, so we'll get to that in a little bit. Below that is a contextual ribbon right here that appears based on whatever tool you have selected. So right now, I have the rectangular marquee tool selected. And it gives me options relating to the rectangular marquee tool. If I were to switch, for example, to the brush tool, it's going to give me options relating to the brush tool. So depending on what tool you have active, you're going to get different options in that contextual ribbon. You have the standard tool set running down the left side of the page here. These are the most common tools that you'll be using. Do pay attention to these tools because underneath the tools, if there's a little triangle, there's always more tools that you can pick from. So if you're not finding a particular tool, look underneath it because it might have one of the other tools that you need. Okay, So those are your standard tools. On the right side here, uh, we have, by default, we have our color and our swatches palettes. We also have layers, channels, and paths uh, showing by default. Next to that, they, they, in all their infinite wisdom, have the Learn Photoshop tab. Uh, and they have whatever this library section is. We won't use any of this over the course of the semester. So you can actually click this little double arrow to collapse them down and give yourself a little bit more workspace. The other thing that we can do is we can change the workspace altogether. I thought it was there. Nope, we're not sharing. That's interesting. Well, I'll figure out where the, 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 where the workspace changes. It used to be right there where you change it. So I don't know. I'll have to figure it out. Um, we'll come back to that in a little bit. OK, so first thing I do is I have my image open. And I'm going to go ahead and press Control-0 on the keyboard, which will fill the image to the available screen space. So Control-0 is a keyboard shortcut. You hold down Control and then press 0, uh, and it'll fill your image to the available screen. And now that I have that, we're going to start working our way through a variety of uh, little mini tutorials that I have written out. All of these are available on the course website. So if we go over here into our tutorial section, we go to Photoshop. Um, let me make this a little bit bigger for a second. There we go. Photoshop, we're going to start with this Photoshop 1.1, black and white. And on all of these, I actually have a little video that explains it. Uh, and then I have step-by-step -step instructions for, for it as well. So if you guys get a little bit lost, you can reference this. I'm obviously going to do it live, so I won't end up referencing uh, the, the tutorial that much. I'm just going to uh, do it in front of you. Um, so when I convert an image to black and white, uh, I'm going to take this particular image, and I want to convert it to black and white. And what people who are not experienced in Photoshop typically do is they run up to the image tab here, and they say, Mode, Grayscale. Boom. And guess what? This thing pops up saying, are you sure you want to discard color information? Well, if the computer is asking you, do you want to discard something, it's probably a sign that maybe there's a better way. So no, I don't want to do that, so we're going to cancel it. So instead, we're going to do something that's called an adjustment layer. And we're going to try to do all of our adjustments using these adjustment layers, because we can turn them on and turn them off at will. And it makes it really easy to work with. So instead of going up to Image here, I'm going to go to Layer. And I'm going to come down to New Adjustment Layer. And so these are all different adjustments that we can typically uh, apply. Now the one that I'm going to do is, shockingly, not the one called Black and White. This is always interesting right? when you throw, throw you guys for a loop. We're going to do something called a Channel Mixer instead. And we get, we're going to get better results out of this. So I'm going to go up to New Adjustment Layer, and I'm going to choose Channel Mixer. And instead of calling it Channel Mixer 1, I'm going to rename this layer to be Black and White. Right? Renaming your layers is always nice. Do you have to do it? No. But if you do it, it'll make it much easier to know what's on a given layer. Yeah? Uh, you should tell people to click in the little, uh, the little block, because when you make changes in layer, if it is blocked, it's not going to take them. You see that little pointing here? It always happens to me. 
this little thing. Keep, you clicking here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but we don't need to do that yet. OK. So I'll go ahead and say OK. So um, in, in this case, this is a, this is a good, uh, good point. So our image, when it opens, is on this background layer. And you can see that that's italicized. And it also has a little lock icon on it. That means that this layer is locked, and it's a background layer. We can't adjust it or anything. If we want to change it to be working on it, we would right click on it and say layer from background, and it'll convert into an active layer. We actually today are only working in our adjustment layers, so we don't need to do anything with the background. It can just sit as is. It can be locked. Okay. So we're working on our uh, adjustment here. And I called this black and white. When we have an adjustment layer, right above it here in the properties window are properties relating to our adjustment. And so right now, uh, this is the channel mixer adjustment. So the first thing that I'm going to ask you to do is you'll see that there is a little um, word here that says monochrome and a checkbox next to it. When I check that box for monochrome, you'll see that it immediately converts the image from color to black and white. And you can see it kind of do a live preview, and your image will convert to black and white. I'm going to do this in another image so you can see it there as well. So that by itself just converted the image to black and white. OK, that's nice. I now have a black and white image. But we also have some flexibility in how we apply the black and white to the image. So I'm going to come up here under the preset section here. And when I click down on preset, you'll notice that there are uh, six black and white filters that you can apply when you do this. Uh, first one is black and white infrared, and then we have blue, green, orange, red, and yellow. If we were a professional photographer who was shooting in black and white, like with a film camera back in the day, if we were Ansel Adams or something like that, right, we might go out and, and buy a piece of glass, a lens, that had a particular color tint to it to affect how our black and white image was processed. So this is a physical thing that you used to do to the camera. Now we can do it in Photoshop after the fact. So we take our image in color, and then we can choose to have an infrared filter or a blue filter or a green filter or any of the rest of the filters applied. And so what I would encourage you to do is to cycle through these and decide which one makes your image look the best. So if we start with infrared, you say, OK, that looks like a black and white image. Then we continue. And you can see each time I do this, it's still a black and white image, but how the black and white is applied changes. And we get different results as we run through the, the different filters. And so you have to uh, decide visually which one looks the best. To me, I think because of the sky in this particular image, the red filter actually kind of brings out the sky a little bit more than the other filters. So rather than just committing to, oh, it's black and white now, I've actually thought about how I want it to be black and white and how I want to use the colors to enhance the black and white image. Let me go ahead and open up another one so you can see me do this again. I'm going to pick an image with a lot of color in it so you can see the transformation a little bit more. So I picked this image. I'm going to go ahead and do the same conversion. And you'll see me do this several times on all of these so you can kind of get that, um, that practice in. So first thing I'll do is I'll go up to Layer. I'll go to New Adjustment Layer. And I'm going to choose Channel Mixer for my adjustment layers. There it is. This will again be called Black and White. And I'll go ahead and say OK. And once I've done the channel mixer layer right here. It's called black and white. It's on top of the background layer. I can look in the properties window right here, and I can change this to be monochrome. So it's just that check mark converts it to black and white. Then I'll go up to my presets, and I'll cycle through from infrared down through all of my various filters here. And in this, in this particular image, you can see a rather dramatic change as I jump between filters. So again, I think the red filter is pretty good. Right? The yellow filter is not bad. The blue filter is awful. So I can go through and I can kind of cycle, hey, which one of these looks the best? So maybe I end up liking the yellow filter. And I, okay, that's a nice black and white image. So that's how we're going to do our conversions into black and white. So that's the first part. Once I've applied one of these adjustment layers, it exists on the layer itself. So down here in the Layers window, I can turn on and off the adjustment just by clicking the little eyeball that's next to the adjustment. So I could turn off the black and white or turn it back on whenever I decide I want to have it on or have it off, which is really convenient. Same thing if I jump back to this particular image, I could turn off that black and white adjustment. So we've now done the black and white. That's the first one. And I've turned it off on both of these images so that we can go ahead and work on the next adjustment. Now, you don't have to turn them off. 
right? You could just keep stacking them onto each other. You could select which ones. Maybe you don't want your final image to be in black and white. Maybe you do. For today's purposes, you're going to do all of these to every image, and you'll end up posting all of them. So you'll post 18 total images today, which we'll get to that in a second, um, because I want you to go through the practice of doing it on all of these images. So let's move on. The next one is Photoshop 1.2 or a levels adjustment. So I talked about levels in the lecture itself. We're going to do a levels adjustment on this image first. So I'll do that by again going up to the layer menu. It's going to be new adjustment layer and we're going to choose levels this time. And I'm going to go ahead and leave it called uh, the layer called levels. That makes sense. And I'll go ahead and say okay. Now as soon as I create that levels adjustment in my properties over here, I'm getting a different set of properties. So remember on the black and white, I had a properties that look like this with these little sliders. The levels adjustment looks different. And in the levels adjustment, it gives me that what's called the histogram or this graph of the distribution of black and white pixels in the image. So it's just taking the colors and assigning a relative gray value to every color as we go through. So a relative lightness or darkness value to that pixel. So in this particular image, if I look at what is pure white, well, this sun is pretty much pure white. It's not really light gray, it's really white. And if we look at our histogram here, the, the graph that comes down really ends right at about where pure white is. So I'm right. But if I look here and I say, well, where's pure black? Pure black might be down here in the, the shadows of the, the, the footprints in the sand or maybe up here in the grass. It's really not. It's kind of a dark gray. And lo and behold, it's a dark gray on the histogram. So what I'm going to do to make this adjustment is I'm going to take this little slider right here, and I'm going to pull that slider over to where the black starts. So where the graph starts to go up, that's where I'm going to place my black. And you can see that it immediately changes the look of the image quite a lot. So it's a, it's a pretty dramatic change. On the right side here, there's not a whole lot that I can do to change. I already have pretty much pure white. Could I pull it over slightly? Sure. But it's not going to change too much. Now, if I pull it over too far, you can see that it's going to blow out the sky and keep assigning values to white there. Likewise, if I pull the black too far, it's going to make everything go into shadow. So really, I'm looking for these to fall right about there and right about there. So wherever the graph starts. So let me jump over to this photograph here, and we'll do the same thing. I'm going to go up to Layer, New Adjustment Layer, and we'll do Levels. We'll leave it called Levels, and I'll go ahead and say OK. So now in this image, I look at the histogram, and this is why it's, it's different depending on what image you're looking at. If I look at this image and I say, OK, well, is there too black? Well, the shadows in here are awfully dark. And if I look at the histogram, yeah, that's pretty much the black is right there. Likewise, on the other side, pure white, well, the clouds have some nice pure white in them. And yep, I, I have pure white all the way here. So there's really not a levels adjustment that I can make to this image. Could I pull the black over slightly? Could I pull it over just a whisker? Sure. But it's not going to make dramatic change like this image would have made. right? So that levels adjustment made a big difference here and here. The levels adjustment, even if I pull that over slightly, you know, it really didn't make much of a difference. So it's going to be dependent on your image itself as to how much of an adjustment it can make. Let me go ahead and open up another one. Um, let me try this one here. Okay, so let's look at the levels adjustment here. I'll go up to layer, new adjustment layer, levels. And so if we look at this, again, the histogram looks completely different. The black would be right here, and yes, we have true black. And you can always see this really quickly by pulling these sliders a little bit. There's just not a lot of, of change that I can make here. The white, we're close to pure white, but it's not quite pure white. So I can pull that over just a bit to say maybe right about there. So it's not a dramatic change, but it's a little bit of a change. So depending on your image, this image was a dramatic change. This image was kind of a medium level change, and this image had almost no change. So I'm going to have you go through your images. That's part of why I'm asking you for three images today, because I want you to see how it affects different images. And so when we do these, it may or may not help your particular image. So we've just done levels. The next one we're going to do is the curves adjustment. And this is the one that I was telling you was really hard to explain in lecture format. So I'm going to do a curves adjustment. And I'll do that again by going to Layer, 
new adjustment layer, and this time I'm going to choose curves. So I did levels last time, we're going to do curves this time. We'll leave it called curves, and I'll go ahead and say okay. Now we get, lo and behold, a completely different properties menu now. And so with a curves adjustment, we still see that histogram in the background, the distribution of colors, but we get this really diagonal line here. And so what this diagonal line represents is the relative color values in different parts of the image. So the lower part of this line is the dark values, and the upper part of this line are the light values in the image. So if I were to click and set a point right in the center of this image, I can generally make the image lighter, or I can generally make the image darker. Okay, and if I, get, if I go too far, I'm going to blow out the image in one direction or the other. So I could, overall, I could adjust the image slightly darker. Overall, I could adjust the image slightly lighter. I'm going to put it right back in the middle. I'm going to leave that point there, and then I'm going to make a point right here, about halfway up the, the upper half of this. If I click on this point, and I hold and I drag, I can make the lighter parts of the image lighter. I can make the lighter parts of the image darker. So I can selectively adjust parts of the image. So I'm working with just the, the uh, lighter parts of the image. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave it just slightly above there. And notice that when I did that, it's caused a little bit of a curve to happen in the lower part here. So I'm going to enhance that curve just a little bit more. So this looks a little bit like an S, a very elongated S. And this is something that photographers tend to refer to as an S curve. In, in, and this is kind of a typical adjustment that you would perform in a curves adjustment. So it's like a slight S to it. So the middle stays fixed, the lighter becomes a little bit lighter, the uh, darker becomes just a little bit darker. And we can see it on and off what that change is doing. And again, this is the kind of thing where you have to do it so you can start to see how that affects the image. Let's do it again for one of these other images. So I'll go up again to my uh, layer, new adjustment layer, and I'll go to curves, and I'll go ahead and say OK. And again, here's my histogram, and here's my curve. I'll peg the center, so I'll pin that right in the center. Then I'm going to pull this up just a little bit, and I'll pull this one down just a little bit like that. And once I've done that, you should be able to see a slight transformation in that image. So again, it makes a bigger difference when you're looking at it on your screen, which is why you're going to uh, all do it. I'll do it one more time on this image. I don't think this one affects it too much, but I'll go up to uh, layer, new adjustment layer, and we'll do curves. There it is. I'll, again, I'll peg the center, and I'll pull this up a little bit, and I'll pull this down just a little bit, and we can look at it. Yeah. It did a little bit to it. It made this a little bit on the yellow side. Um, that might be a saturation problem. We have to work through that. So I've gone ahead and I've done that on all of the images. So that is my curves adjustment. The next one is something called pop. And pop is something that works especially well in like a sunset type image. So I'm going to go ahead and open an image with a lot of saturation, a lot of color in it. So something like that image. And I'll work with pop here. I'll do it to the other ones too, but it doesn't affect it as much. So we're looking for something with a lot of oranges uh, and yellows in it. So on a pop, what we're going to do is we're going to try to bring out the various colors in their respective channels. So I'm going to go up to my layer, and I'll come down to new adjustment layer. And this time, I'm going to choose channel mixer again. So remember, channel mixer was the one that I used for black and white. I'm going to use it again, but I'm going to use it differently this time. So I'll go ahead and choose Channel Mixer, but I'm going to rename this to be Pop. And I'll go ahead and say OK. So now I'm going to come back and I'm going to look at the Channel Mixer properties here. And the output channel that's currently showing is red. Notice that if I choose a different one, I can choose red, green, or blue as my output channels. I'm going to stick on red for a second. And with red selected here in the output channel, I'm going to boost the value of the red here. So I'm going to go up to, say, 116. Now, we don't want 
to overly skew the values such that uh, we're getting too much red in the image. We just want to boost the red a little bit. So we're actually going to subtract off the green and the blue because we want our total to be 100%. So right now my total is above 100%. So I'm going to actually drop this down to minus 8 and minus 8. And now my total is going to end up being 100%. I'm then going to switch my output channel from red to green, and I'll take the green to uh, 116%, and I'll do minus 8 for the red and minus 8 for the blue. Then I'll switch my output channel to blue and change blue to 116, and green to minus 8, and red to minus 8. So I've gone through and I've adjusted it for each red, green, and blue and I boosted their respective values in their channel. And now you should be able to see a slight boost, and you'll see this probably more on your computers than you would on uh, the screen because of the projector. Um, it's actually boosting out the oranges uh, quite a bit and really enhancing the sunset um, and dramatizing the colors a little bit. You can see it change a little bit on the screen, but not that much. Let me do it again, and I'll do it with this image. So I'll go up to Layer. I'll go to New Adjustment Layer, and I'm going to do a Channel Mixer. We'll rename this Channel Mixer to be Pop. And I'll go through on my various output channels. So we'll start with the red output channel, and I'll do 116. These are values that I think work nicely. Uh, you know, could you do 120 and minus 10, minus 10? Sure. Could you do 115, um, well, 114, minus 7, minus 7? Sure. Uh, I just find 116 to be right about the right sweet spot. So we'll do 116, and then we'll do minus 8 and minus 8. And then we'll change our output channel to be green, and we'll say minus 8, 116, and minus 8. There we go. And the last one is blue, and we'll take the blue to 116, and we'll go red minus 8 and green minus 8. Oops. And there we are. Now I can toggle that one on and off, and it's really it's pulling out the reds and the yellows quite a lot in that particular image, which may or may not be desirable. That's the other thing to always keep in mind, is that you perform this and you say, mm, do I really like it or do I not like it, when it comes to the assignment. For the exercise, you're doing it anyway, because I want that skill. Um, so I'll do it one more time. I'll do it, uh, I'll do it on this image. Probably won't change too much. Yeah. You're bringing up the colors. You're enhancing the colors of the image. So I'll do it one more time. We'll go to Layer, New Adjustment Layer, and I'm going to do a Channel Mixer. And on the Channel Mixer here, I'm going to say on, we'll start with the red channel. This would be 116, minus 8, and minus 8. And then we'll switch over into the green channel. Again, 116, and then red is going to be minus 8, and blue is going to be minus 8. And the last one would be blue, 116, and we'll say minus 8, and minus 8. And there we go. So in this particular image, it changes it just a bit. I can see it in the, the little toolies. You probably can't see it. Um, on the screen because it's just not enough of a change. So again, it works really well for images that are dominated with reds and yellows and oranges. Um, doesn't do as much for, say, the, the blues. Okay? So I've gone through and I've done pop. The next one here is 1.5, which is dodge and burn. And what dodge and burn is, is it's essentially back when you used to use film, you would go into a dark room to develop the film. And depending on which chemicals you used or how you dipped the, the, the photos that you were exposing in the chemicals, you could selectively darken or lighten parts of your image. Uh, so it was a chemical process. We can do that digitally in Photoshop um, using the dodge and burn uh, tools. So we're going to go ahead and, and do this, but we're going to do it a little bit differently. Typically what people do when they work with dodge and burn is they just come over and they say, oh, I'm going to work with the dodge tool or the burn tool, and I go right onto the image and I start working on it. Unfortunately, that manipulates the image and can cause some damage to the image itself. So we'd like to preserve the image and just do this on another layer. 
So to do that, we're going to do it slightly differently. So previously, I've always been going to Layer, New Adjustment Layer. This time, we're going to go up to Layer, New Layer. So it's just a regular layer, not an adjustment layer. So we go Layer, New Layer, and we'll call this uh, DNB, Dodge and Burn. And before I say OK, I'm going to change something. So right down here under Mode, I'm going to change from Normal to uh, Overlay. So I'm going to change the mode to overlay. And as soon as I do that, there's a checkbox that becomes available to me that says fill with an overlay neutral 50% gray. So we want to check that box. So I'm going to go to mode overlay and check the box for fill with overlay neutral color 50% gray. So those two are critical. I'll go ahead and say OK. And my layer looks different down here. It doesn't have a little adjustment anymore. It doesn't have a white uh, layer mask. It has just this gray layer here. So with that gray layer, I can then come over to the Dodge and Burn tools. So there's two tools. The Dodge tool is for lightning. It looks like a, a, a dropper with a stick on the end or a ball with a stick on the end, for lack of a better term. And the Burn tool looks like a little hand. And they're hidden underneath each other. I'm going to start with the Burn tool, which is going to selectively darken parts of the image. I'm going to show you an example here. So essentially, if I wanted this part of the image to become darker, now all I have to do is start painting in that section. And you can see as I start to paint it that that piece becomes darker. You guys see how that works? So I'm going to undo that. So let me back up here so that I'm back to my original. Oops, I went one too many steps there. And instead of doing just it in one place, I'm going to make my brush a little bit larger. So in my little contextual uh, ribbon up here, I'm going to click on where the brush would be. And I'm going to change the size so that it's much larger. And as you make it larger, you're probably going to move the mouse over the image to kind of see the preview of your brush size. So we'll do something, I'm probably about 500. No, that's 1,000. That's a little too many. There. There's about 500. Okay. The alternative would be you can use the bracket keys on the keyboard to increase the size or decrease the size of the brush. Um, I typically use the bracket keys because it makes life a little bit easier. So now I'm going to say, OK, well, I want to darken certain parts of the image. So there's a little artifact down here in the bottom. I want to darken that up. So we'll darken that bottom up just a little bit. Maybe I'll darken this side. And I'll give just a little bit of darkening on the edges, maybe a little bit up in here, maybe about like that. And so then we can see that was the original, and there it is darkened up a little bit. So I'm making some adjustments there. The alternative would be to use the uh, Dodge tool. Again, I can use the brackets, and I could lighten up something. So I'm not really sure what I would want to lighten up here, but maybe I want to lighten up over here so I can lighten up those trees. Um, but again, it's a matter of preference. That's not going to show up too much. There's a subtle difference there in the trees, but it's there. So you can selectively lighten and selectively darken parts of the image. So, excuse me, same thing here. Uh, let's do the, the, the sunset here, because you'll be able to see this pretty well. Uh, I can go up to my layer, new layer. And I'm going to change my mode to overlay and check this box for fill with overlay neutral 50% gray. And we'll call this DNB. And I'll go ahead and say OK. There it is. And now, once again, I want to come in and use my burn tool. I might make it a little bit bigger here. And I'm going to selectively darken these upper clouds just a little bit. So I've darkened those up. Maybe I want to darken right there along the horizon. And yeah, maybe that didn't turn out the way I wanted it to. You know, you can always you can play around with this stuff. Uh, the advantage is if you don't like something, you can, of course, go back to the dodge tool and you could lighten that up if you wanted to. Sometimes that doesn't work as well, so you can just use the Control Z to undo. So we can undo and say, eh, I didn't really like that. Let's go back to uh, where I started right there, for example. So you kind of play around with it. Worst case is you just start a new dodge and burn layer, and you turn that one off and, and do it again. So the idea here is that you can enhance parts of the image. So let me go back to my burn. And maybe we'll burn some more of these waves down here at the bottom. We'll darken those up a little bit. 
or, or whatever. And again, you guys have to decide how much is too much, et cetera. So you can keep pushing the, those values and decide, eh, I like it or I don't like it. Okay? So that's dodging and burning. When yeah. I, I create a new layer, I get the one with nothing. I get just a background. So when you go to layer, new layer, yeah. you have to make sure you check these boxes. So layer, okay. new layer, and then right here, the mode has to be changed to overlay, and then this checkbox has to be checked. The Fill with overlay neutral 50% gray. So the mode has to be overlay. So the mode is overlay, and the fill with neutral 50% gray. Next class, I will explain what this mode overlay is and means. It's called a blending mode, and I'll talk about what that is and how it works. Uh, but it's not, for right now, you just need to trust me, switch it to that. We'll talk about it next class. Okay, so that's the dodge and burn. Um, I, I'm not going too extensively into the other, and nor are you required to go into the other adjustment layers. Those are the ones that I want you to learn for today. But I want to talk through a couple other things that are, these things are just optional that I think at some point you might need to know. So bear with me while we go through it. Uh, the first one is the crop tool. So if you decide you don't like what a particular image looks like or you want to change the cropping of an image, you can come down here. It looks like two rulers that kind of overlap and intersect with each other. If I click on that, it's going to give me the crop tool. I can specify a particular ratio. So if I wanted to, to crop to square, for example, I could change to square. Or if I wanted to, to crop to a certain size, you know, if I wanted it to be a 5x7 print, I could crop to 5x7. I can also flip which one's 5 and which one's 7 if I wanted to. From there, I can adjust these, uh, these little pinch points here to decide where the appropriate, uh, you know, like if I'm following the rule of thirds, where do I want uh, a part of this image to fall? You know, do I want to see just the sunset and have it, you know, right there, for example, as a way of recropping. When I'm done with my crop, I'm going to click this little check mark up here at the top in the contextual ribbon and say, yes, that's now my new size of my image. So that's how you would do cropping if you wanted to do cropping. I'm going to go ahead and go back. So I'll press Control Z. I don't need to do the cropping, but I wanted to point that out uh, for you. Um, the other thing, there's, there's the crop again. OK, so on the saturation and vibrance here, uh, we would again go to Layer, New Adjustment Layer. And we have two choices. We've got a hue and saturation adjustment. And where's the vibrance one? Right vibrance, right above it. Thank you. So I'll do the hue and saturation first, just so you can see the difference. So here we are in our hue and saturation. This would allow us to change, for example, the overall color tone of the image, if we wanted to. I'm going to go back to 0. Don't need to do that. But right below that is our saturation. So I can increase how much of the color. So notice as I keep boosting this up, it's really bringing out the red of the dress, but at a certain point, the colors of the people are becoming too orange. Okay? So that's a saturation adjustment. So I'll leave that kind of overdone there. The alternative to that would be under Layer, New Adjustment Layer, Vibrance, right here. And so here's our Vibrance. Now, it also allows me to do the saturation on this one, so I could do it, but let's concentrate on the Vibrance. The vibrance, remember, is pulling out the colors that are not the skin tone colors. So I can actually push this one all the way up to 100%, and I'm getting a lot of saturation in the blues and the skies of the background, but that's entirely different than doing the saturation up at 100%, which is changing the skin tones. And you can see it in the skin tones there. Does that make sense, the difference? So depending on what you're doing, you can work with the vibrance and saturation values uh, to get better results out of your image. This was actually a good example because you could see it. Uh, so that was, that's that. Let me see if there's anything else. Uh, no, the next thing we need to do is talk about how you're saving and posting your images. So theoretically, we have an image where we've done all of the above. Have I done all of these? Um, is there one? Yeah, this one, I, I, I've, I've done all of, uh, all of the steps, so I'll use this as my example. You're going to do this for three total images. So first thing I'll do is I'll turn everything off. So let me make sure all the adjustments are off. I have just the original image here. I'm going to go ahead and go up to File, and then I'll go to Export, and I'm going to choose Export As. 
And it's possible on some of these, uh, these handouts that you'll be getting uh, that I will use Save for Web. Uh, Save for Web, Adobe basically cut that out. It's still available in there, but I'm trying to convert all my stuff over. But sometimes I forget to change the handouts and, and I haven't caught them. So bear with me while I do this. But essentially, we're going to do the file export, export as. And then right here, this is our export as dialog box. This is how we're going to basically create our images to post. Now, if you were going to use this image to print or you were going to use it as your final image for assignment one or whatever, you wouldn't want to change the size of the image at all. Today we're posting 18 images. I don't need full resolutions for everything that you're posting. I can take nice small resolutions. That's fine for what we're doing. So over here under image size, so first off, file settings, JPEG. Okay, that's by default. Next thing here is image size. I'm going to take whatever, either the width or the height, whatever one is larger, and I'm going to change the larger one to 1,000. And essentially it's going to make the size of the file significantly smaller. And that'll make uploading them easier and, and what have you down the road. So we're going to go ahead and change whatever the larger one is to 1,000. When I'm done, I can come all the way down here and I'll click on Export All. Now, I'm going to go ahead and save this. Let me back out here and let me create a folder for today. And I'm going to save it in here and I'm going to, I'll just use the image uh, name, but I'm going to underscore original. So I know which version it is. So that's the original file. And I'll go ahead and say save. Perfect. Now I'll come up and I'll turn on the black and white. <coughs> you see where this is going. Then I'll go up to file, export, export as. Good news here is the default options now change to be 1,000. So it's already set at 1,000. So, you, you change when you keep it? Once you change one, it it, right. It should keep it, theoretically. Uh, and I'll go ahead and click on export all. It's the same file, except instead of original, this would be black and white. So I might add uh, BW to this one. And then I'll go ahead and save it. Then I'll turn on my levels. Now at this point, I can choose to turn on or turn off the black and white. I can leave it on or I can leave it off. I'm going to leave it off. And I'll go to file, uh, export, export as, export all. And this is going to be levels. And I'll click save. Perfect. Then I would move up to the next one. And here's curves. And I'll go to file, export, export as. And this one is now curves. Next one was pop, so file. Export, export as. And the last one was the dodge and burn. And actually, I'm going to leave the other pieces on now, except for the black and white. And I'll go to file, export, export as. And this last one is dodge and burn. So I'll just do DB for dodge and burn. And I'll click Save. So that gives me all the original plus the five edits. So that's six total for this image. You're going to do it for three images. So you'll have 18 total images when it's all done. So now.